Good afternoon, everyone, uh, or good morning, depending on where you're uh, viewing this from. Um, my name is Anita Waters. I'm a member of the uh, National Committee of the Communist Party, and I'm also the uh, chair of the Ohio District uh, of the, the CPUSA. Um, and uh, today, we're, um, I, by the way, I'm, a, I'm trained as a sociologist, so we're talking about working class culture today a Marxist analysis, and I, uh, I uh, worked in the fields of, of anthropology and sociology for a long time, and um, we did partial Marxist analyses, but, uh, but we're, we're um, very influenced by Marx in, in those fields, but uh, we'll try to do, um, you know, a little bit more deep dive into it uh, today. So I want to say at the very beginning that I'm just starting the discussion today. I know there's others weighing in after me on the same subject. So I am not going to have any final answers. I don't pretend to have any final answers on the questions of working class culture. So I'm going to be raising questions here um, that we can talk about during the discussion period and that I would love to hear uh, from others. And by the way, thank you uh, to Dee and the rest of the educational uh, collective for inviting me to do this. Um, the the uh, classes so far have been very exciting, and especially this morning's, so that was great. Okay, so, um, and instead of pausing for discussion, I'm just going to plow right through I have about 30 minutes, and then I'll turn it over to others. So, um, I made a presentation back in uh, the part one of the National Marxist School in June on ruling class culture. So if we can say that there's a ruling class culture, and I thought, of course, that, that we could, what can we say about its opposite? That is a working class culture. What characterizes working class ways of life? What conclusions have people drawn about working class culture? And can a working class way of life facilitate the unity, autonomy, and consciousness of the working class itself? So first we have to, uh, review a couple of concepts um, and very similar to what we did with ruling class culture. What do we mean by culture? What do we mean by class? Uh, what does a Marxist analysis tell us about a culture based on the forces that shape it in the political economy? How does working class culture struggle with ruling class ideas that are promulgated in commercial culture industry and in academia and in our political discourse in general? And then we're going to take a look at what some writers have asserted about the culture of working class people at different points in uh, history. And we'll, um, we'll consider especially how uh, people have characterized working class culture as critically anti-individualistic. So first, in my research on culture, I discovered actually a concept of culture in Lenin's work just after the victory of the October Revolution. Lenin called for a cultural revolution. And he used that term in three ways. First, he meant in material infrastructure like telegraph services and electrification. Second, he used the word culture to mean um, uh, art, music, literature, and a lot of people will still use culture this way. Um, and by the way, Lenin felt that, these, that that kind of culture would be uh, in the service of building socialism. Um, so uh, the third sense uh, of the term in Lenin's work was political education. And in the aftermath of that revolution, the Bolshevik revolution, just like the 1959 revolution in Cuba, um, in both places, a program of literacy was um, uh, undertaken um, that really focused on having people read revolutionary texts. Um, the Soviet philosopher Afanasyev, I'll murder his name a couple of times today, use the concept of social consciousness to refer to what might be called culture in other contexts. He said uh, this uh, social consciousness was the aggregate of people's ideas, theories, views, social feelings, habits, and morals. And much like social consciousness, the way anthropologists have used uh, the term culture since at least the 1920s is to refer to the customs of uh, social groups, the customs, languages, technologies, morality, belief, um, all of the practices that are passed down from generation to generation 
in a specific geographic area. This is what anthropologists see as culture. So can we talk about culture associated with class, as in ruling class culture and working class culture? Members of both classes, of course, share the same language and many of the same customs and, of course, the same geographical space. But a Marxist approach would recognize that class position shapes the thoughts and ideas of individuals. And by definition, it also determines the techniques with which one must eke out a living given scarce resources. So what do we mean by uh, class? Well, of course, class are groups of people with the same relationship to the means of production. Because they're, uh, of their position in the economy, the labor of one class, the working class, is appropriated by another class, the ruling class. And our program says, points out that the, the US has actually uh, one of the most controlling, uh, uh, um, entrenched uh, capitalist ruling classes ever, concentrating enormous political, economic, and military power in the hands of a few transnational corporations led by global finance and the politicians who do their bidding. So this is what the working class is facing. And by the way, Alvaro, the other night, Thursday night had a really good point about the difference between the capitalist class and the ruling class. And I am guilty of using those two terms kind of interchangeably. Okay, so the working class is characterized in contrast by its enormous size compared to the ruling class and by its diversity. As the road to socialism says, um, the working class includes people of all genders, all age groups, people of all racial, ethnic, and national backgrounds, and also people in and out of the labor force. Alvaro also made that point on Thursday. People staying home and taking care of the, their kids while their partners work. These people are also members of the working class. The vast majority of the population, of course, is the working class, selling their labor power to corporations and, and being dependent for their survival on paychecks. The vastness of the working class is conveyed in that uh, concept uh, popularized by the Occupy movement uh, of 1% versus the 99%. Wealth is, of course, very concentrated, and the trend is towards further concentration. The bottom 99% of the population owns less than half the wealth, and the bottom half owns only 3% of the wealth. As um, power is uh, concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, more people are left with only their labor power to sell. And Marx re referred um, in, in different places uh, to, uh, for instance, the proletarianization of peasants. Uh, peasants had to, were sort of forced off their land and into uh, factories in the, in, in the outset of the industrial revolution. Uh, but we look now to the group labeled as professionals, and, and perhaps my comrade um, uh, Scott will have something to say about this group later. As a group category in sociology, professionals have, uh, are a group that have technical training um, that's exclusive to them and that grants them some kind of autonomy in making decisions. Um, but increasingly, these professionals work for profit-driven corporations, and it puts them into the same relationship to the means of production as industrial workers are. Um, increasingly, we see the realization uh, of this in uh, unionization efforts by medical doctors, college faculty, librarians, uh, and museum staff. Um, to form a union is an implicit recognition of working class status. So where, uh, when, when and, well, when the 99% um, become a conscious working class, that will be either the victory of socialism or the final battle. Um, and that's why we have to look at working class culture. What is the morality, beliefs, and practices that are passed down from one generation to the next within uh, the working class? So some of what uh, I learned about um, when I did research on the ruling class culture is uh, that it would have its corollary in, uh, in about the broadest working class. So for example, um, researchers uh, discovered that the higher the social class, the greater the embrace of class essentialism. 
and that is class essentialism is seeing social class as an unchanging part of a person. So the inverse of this is also true um, by, uh, well, in these findings anyway of these researchers, working class people see class more as a material condition, not an intrinsic part of a person's identity. Ruling class culture values individualism, achievement, and virtuosity. Uh, therefore, working class culture places values on community, loyalty, and solidarity. Afanasyev wrote that capitalists place their selfish interests above everything else in the world. The spirit of individualism, self-interest, the thirst for profit, hostility, and competition make up the essence of the ethics of a capitalist society. So therefore, the opposite is true. Working class ethics would therefore be one in which communal interests take precedence over selfish interests, selfish individual interests, and where co cooperation displaces competition. So one characteristic I wanted to uh, highlight that many agree is part of working class ways of life is a specific approach to money. Engels, for instance, wrote that the working man, I guess he's just talking about the working man, probably more than one of them, is, quote, less greedy for money, though they need it far more than the property holding class. For them, money is worth only what it will buy, whereas for the bourgeois, it has a, a special inherent value, the value of a god and makes the bourgeois mean low, the mean low money grubber that he is. The working man who knows nothing of this feeling of reverence for money um, is therefore less grasping than the bourgeois whose whole activity is for the purpose of gain. And by the way, um, another, another sociologist that we don't study as, as a Marxist, of course, because he was not a Marxist, was Max Weber. But Max Weber also points out this um, in the, at the, at the uh, onset of the Industrial Revolution, this reverence for money that was it was it was godly to be uh, to be profiting. Um, so in contemporary social research, this approach to money is studied as generosity. So research finds that lower income people are more generous than higher income people, period. Uh, increasingly, in fact, researchers interestingly found that high economic inequality actually leads high income individuals to be even more selfish with their uh, money, even less generous uh, than they are where economic inequality is relatively low. I thought that was an interesting finding. So when working class uh, culture is re uh, referenced as in the academic literature, a lot of times it's focused mainly on, on uh, industrial workers, basically. And it's often in contrast to middle class or professional class culture, not the, not the tiny ruling class that we, um, we envision uh, the working class as facing. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, there was a lot of attention to studies of the working class. And they focused, of course, solely on industrial workers. It was really accepted at the time that um, the material conditions that gave rise to specific cultures and personality characteristics. Many uh, people sought to explain what political scientist Howard Kimmeldorf called the unique conservatism of American labor. That is, they wanted to explain why radical trade unionism didn't have even more of an impact in the United States. One, uh, one thing he studied was longshoremen on the East Coast, where the IWW had uh, very little power and um, or buy-in from workers with those on the West Coast, where the IWW was much more successful and more influential. And what's interesting about these writers for me is that they do accept uh, the influence of materialism. Um, they do accept that the specific conditions of the workers' industrial environment give way to specific personalities and cultural types. One industrial sociologist even claimed that, quote, every industry breeds its own man, 
unquote. And I think people would argue that there is something unique, for instance, in the way of life of all steel workers, for example. I know steel workers feel that way. Um, or all auto workers have a feeling of uniqueness of their own industry group. Kimmeldorf, um, in contrast, actually argued that he studied that one industry, longshoremen, um, and he, he felt that longshoremen bred very different kinds of people depending on what they brought to the situation. Um, some embraced radicalism and some did not. And his explanation, um, he found, lay in the cultural baggage of the Irish Catholic, Catholics who made up most of the longshoremen in, uh, in New York. And uh, this Irish Catholicism was deeply anti-socialist and gave workers, he says, uh, quote, a mental sluggishness or in the more familiar Leninist idiom, fake, uh, fake false consciousness. So um, Jack Metzger um, is uh, a writer who wrote a book called Bridging the Divide 2021. And he has a lot of, uh, has done a lot of work on working class culture. He distinguishes between people with jobs and people with careers. And the people with jobs are the people he sees as the working class. And he has a reverence for working class culture, um, which is where he came from. And he said one of the one of the ways you distinguish people with jobs versus people with careers is a becoming versus a belonging. People with jobs with up uh, with uh, careers actually that those are reversed. Um, people with careers are interested in this achievement uh, ideology and becoming something else, whereas people with jobs are are uh, have a feeling of belongingness. He says, working class culture embodies what some labor historians have called making do or getting through the day culture, whereas Barbara Jensen, another person he, he cites a lot, is um, she sees working class culture as in, in giving people a roomier sense of now, not looking forward to the next, um, the next thing. Okay, Metzger um, says there's three ways that people talk about working class culture, and he's not agreeing with any of these. He says, first, you can look at it, or people look at it as a deficit culture. That is, it's lagging behind the mainstream, but it's always going to just be a little bit behind, but catching up. Second, uh, it's a dominated culture. That is, um, it's a product of domination where people's behavior is just shaped by the ruling class. and the third way is a residual culture, that is a culture um, like people used to think of Native American culture as destined to fade away. He argues that working class culture, in contrast to these ways, is genuine in the sense that it has an internal coherence that's separate from middle class culture. And of course, middle class culture is something we would probably include under working class culture. Now, probably the most controversial thing in Metzger is this concept, achieving mediocrity. Um, and for him, one uh, for Metzger, one of the signal characteristics of the working class is its equalizing tendencies. He opens his book with a chapter called Achieving Mediocrity, a really kind of provocative phrase. He says it captures something about working class life that is both valuable and very hard to recognize from an achievement point of view. Um, there's a kind of reverse status to being common, to not standing out, a positive value to not putting yourself forward and lording it above everyone else. And this reminded me of, a, uh, of an anthropological essay uh, called Eating Christmas in the Kalahari. Um, it was written in the 1970s and probably read by every Anthro 101 college student for decades. Richard Lee had done a lot of time um, in the Kalahari de Desert doing um, work uh, observing a group of hunting and gathering people called the Dobe Chutwase. And he wanted to show his gratitude and his magnanimity. He wanted to show his generosity. Um, and so he arranged to purchase for community consumption this massive ox from the herd next door or, or whatever. Um, and uh, upon presenting his gift, he, uh, he writes in this essay, he was taunted bitterly and 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 cruelly by by uh, the people who who were taking part in the feast um and they told him that his uh ox was a sad excuse for an ox and 
um, that he had been taken advantage of by the man who sold him the ox. And he was just get generally given a hard time by people. Um, he was put in his place. And I had to think about this. Why did this remind me so much of uh, why did Metzger bring back eating Christmas in the Kalahari? Um, because the Dobe Chutwaze still at that point practiced their hunting and gathering culture. And so is that a working class? And I would say, yeah, that is a working class uh, in, in that society and those in that mode of production, primitive communism, something that, I mean, uh, Karl Marx, when he was writing uh, about prim primitive communism, he certainly was aware of these kind of hunting and gathering societies, which were very egalitarian and just did not put up with anybody putting themselves above uh, other people. Um, but this tendency to pressure toward equality is treated um, by some people as uh, what Metzger calls a deficit culture. There's something wrong with this culture, and that's why they put, put people down. And one of the people that I felt was along the, those lines is Paul Willis. He wrote an influential book called Learning to Labor, um, How Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs. Um, and he's writing about white working class boys in a British secondary school. They developed and shared an oppositional culture, which rejected the school's achievement ideology, especially rejecting any preparation for mental labor, any, pres any idea of going on in school, for example. They instead valued manual labor because they associated it with masculinity and mental labor was associated with femininity. The author of the book views uh, their acceptance of what he called dead-end, low-paying jobs as, um, instead of as a form of uh, class domination, they positively chose to join their brothers and fathers on the shop floor, a, ch a choice that they made happily and apparently free of coercion. Um, that passage in uh, Willis shows that Willis himself feels that industrial labor is somehow intrinsically undesirable. Um, and this is a sentiment shared by other people. Um, some of the workers that Metzger talked about himself, um, talked to himself, um, who profess to hate their jobs. One of the ways he, he distinguishes people with jobs and people with careers is people with jobs are more likely to say they hate their jobs. But of course, he, he recognized that some people really love their jobs, even if they're not, um, they're not uh, lucrative. But Peter Wilson, uh, another uh, writer, he noted, he's an anthropologist, he noted the pull toward the norm um, in working class Caribbean culture, and he cast it, I think, negatively in his book, uh, Crab Antics. And the metaphor goes that one crab can climb out of a bucket, but if there are two crabs in a bucket, they're stuck because one, the one, once the one almost climbs out, the other will pull it back in. Um, and he, he studied this in, a, in a, 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 a culture he calls Providencia. I'm not sure it's real, um, a, a Caribbean island where there was a lot of activity around making sure that nobody had a greater share of land than other people thought was fair. So I wondered at this point, is there a, some contempt for working people in these formulations? For Willis, low paid work is chosen by workers because it's a cultural preference. And that couldn't be more blind to the system of capitalism as we understand it. And this points to one danger of cap cultural explanations. We can't let exploitation of the working class be blamed on their culture. And we have to also, I think, be careful not to overstate the positive characteristics of working class culture. Um, Engels, I think, uh, in the quote, uh, I didn't quote this part, but in the um, he went on, uh, to, uh, to talk about the working working man uh, being, he says, more approachable, friendlier, less prejudiced, um, having, having a clearer eye for facts, um, and, is, and the working man is unlikely to have any deep religious convictions, and he's unlikely to attend church. And of course, this, is, this clearly isn't true of all uh, working class people, even all men of work industrial occupations today. And it may under, underestimate the effect that ruling class ideas on um, those ruling ideas that are so persuasive, they have an effect on the working class as a whole. 
these ideas, those ideas serve capital, um, like notions of social hierarchy based on gender or race, um, and uh, they do permeate our culture industry and our political discourse. So they have an impact on how working people make sense of the, wor of the world. So people, I think the thing is, people have approached working class culture maybe as an empirical question. That is, you make observations, you do surveys and studies to see what's really happening. What You find a person who you, you feel is a working class person, and then you find out how they, what is their way of life. Um, and hope to, to make draw conclusions from those um, those observations outward. Um, and that really depends on how individuals um, are measurements of a whole class. And because of the breadth and diversity of the working class, we might never get a big picture um, that way. So I, I want to propose one way that we might solve this problem, and that is by really focusing on conscious working class culture. It's an approach that instead of is empirical, it's normative. We want to think about what should be the way of life of the conscious working class. A conscious working class would embrace its signal characteristics, of course, of generosity, community centeredness, and value on equality, all of which would help the working class um, in the broad sense that we know it uh, to unite and fight as one against uh, capital. And that's the kind of working class culture that Metzger is referencing when he writes that working class culture emphasizes your place in the group and being loyal to that group. It's the culture that of the conscious working class that our program, The Road to Socialism, is talking about when it says that the working class is, quote, compelled to resist exploitation and always seeks to solve the chronic exploitation and oppression that they face. So we can and we should consciously emphasize and foster those characteristics of our culture that do focus, um, do, do facilitate unity, autonomy, and consciousness. Um, and I do have a couple of questions for discussion. Um, and that's, yeah, that's about 30 minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, what are some of the ways that conscious working class is expressed in today's media environment? And there I want to say, this is one thing we didn't really talk about here, um, you know, was, was, but it's a very interesting question, is portrayals of the working class. I'm thinking about Studs Terkel's books, um, television shows, like the one I, I really uh, found moving was called Made. It was a... Um, M-A-I-D. It was a um, miniseries. Um, the movie, The Florida Project, these are all, um, and I'm sure you have a, a lot more examples of um, portrayals of the working class. Um, and there have been some great ones, but there's also ways of portraying the working class that really reflect ruling class ideas about what the working class should um, should be, should how they should be seen. Um, second, uh, what characteristics of working class culture facilitate these unity, autonomy, and consciousness ideas? And how can the CPUSA and our allies support those characteristics? So uh, that's all I have. I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Eric uh, now, and um, I'll come back in the discussion. I'll be listening carefully. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Anita. Eric, you should be able to show your screen. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Anita. Um, thank you to all the presenters today. This has been a really, really, really great school. I always enjoy watching and learning. Um, my name's Eric Gersovitz. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm in the Los Angeles Metro Club of Communist Party USA. And um, like Anita, my topic today is also working class culture. And so we'll be continuing this um, discussion. And I found this topic really challenging. Um, I wasn't sure at first how to approach a presentation about working class culture. Uh, if ideology arises from the economic base of capitalism, how can we separate out a culture of the working class? And what would it tell us to try? So before I go further, I want to define the capitalist class and the working class as our party program defines them. 
our party program is at the heart of everything we do, and it's the framework by which we move in unity as the Communist Party. So if you haven't read it yet or listened to the audio recording of it, I want to really encourage you to make the time to do so. So the capitalist class are the owners of the factories, agribusiness, financial institutions, distributive infrastructure, and retail giants, or in other words, the owners of the means of production and distribution. The working class is everyone who must make their living from wages and salaries. So being working class is not about how much money you make, it's about your relation to capital. And I hope we can find ways of making this much clearer because as Marxists, we know that it's the working class, not income-based subsections of the working class that is the revolutionary class. Capitalism is a system that necessitates paying workers less than the value they produce. Paying workers less than the value they produce is what we call exploitation, and all workers under capitalism must be exploited. The common interest across workers of all income brackets is that the working class is the vehicle by which we can advance beyond capitalism. And the fact that there's a difference between capitalists who are owners of the means of production and workers who must make their living from wages and salaries already suggests that there must be a difference in the experience of working class people and the experience of big and small capitalists. When we talk about a working class culture, we mean the shared experience and ways of being of the working class specific to the working class. Working class culture arises from class struggle, and because the working class is the revolutionary class, promoting a better understanding of this shared experience and these ways of being can advance revolutionary consciousness. Like the working class, the capitalist class also has a culture, but unlike the working class, the capitalist class is in power. So many of its cultural features are easily found within our popular culture, even though these features are only of real benefit to members of the capitalist class. Chapter two of the Communist Manifesto says, the ruling ideas of each age have ever been the ideas of its ruling class. In order to know how to better separate out working class culture from the ruling ideas of our time, I think it'll be helpful first to give some examples of capitalist class culture. So some of the features of capitalist class culture are individualism, competition, status, ruthlessness as a virtue, private schools, in other words, schools for members of the capitalist class, other exclusive communities, spaces, events, and camaraderie with their class. And um, this is a picture of the East Hampton Golf Club in East Hampton, New York. Here's a quote from Anita's presentation from June on ruling class culture, which you can watch on the CPUSA YouTube channel and which I highly recommend watching. Quote, members of the ruling class think their personal interest and the public interest are the equal, end quote. So that's the belief that increasing profit is the best way to benefit the world. Maybe you've heard this sentiment before. I know I have. Some more features of capitalist class culture are bourgeois art. In other words, art that reinforces capitalist ideology. The notion that charity is the best way to respond to inequity. Employees as capitalists see them are business assets, not friends, and capitalists find that confusing the two leads to problems for the capitalist. Protection of wealth within families and for generations, and legacy. Capitalists view themselves as the natural and rightful leaders and workers as naturally in need of guidance. Many of us have seen the video of the multimillionaire real estate CEO, Tim Gurner, who said, quote, unemployment has to jump 40 to 50% in my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. There's been a systematic change where employees feel the employer is extremely lucky to have them as opposed to the other way around. And he went on to say, we've got to kill that attitude and that has to come through hurting the economy.
In a book called Bridging the Divide, author Jack Metzger, as we just heard a little bit about, uses a non-Marxist analysis to highlight some more differences between the working class and what he calls the professional middle class, or as he also puts it, people with jobs as opposed to people with careers. Again, this definition is not Marxist. Our definition of class is based on one's relation to capital, and so it's not accurate and only serves the interests of the maintenance of capitalism to view higher earning workers or college educated workers as a separate class. All workers under capitalism are paid less than the value they produce. Nevertheless, Metzger's analysis of this so-called middle class is still useful because we can translate it to understand the culture of small capitalists. Here's some more of Jack Metzger's capitalist class cultural observations. Again, these are traits which, are, which he incorrectly attributes to a middle class. And I also want to say that these features are not absolute or definitive. They're just a starting point from one person's observations for understanding what we're referring to. So to continue, he mentions doing and becoming as opposed to being and belonging. Um, he says that capitalist class is future oriented as opposed to present oriented high expectations, preference for pursuing dreams, aspirations, and some idealism. And of course, being future-oriented and having a preference for pursuing dreams becomes more feasible when you own capital. And also, life is transformative. And if you own the means of production and distribution, these cultural features are genuinely helpful. In other words, if you're a capitalist, it isn't a mistake to compete ruthlessly. If you are a capitalist, you are better able to experience life as transformative. For members of the capitalist class, these cultural features are second nature. So, now that we've had a chance to make sure we recognize which features represent the culture of the ruling class, let's turn to the topic of this presentation, which is working class culture. Some of the elements of working class culture are collectivity, solidarity, dignity in work community, sharing, loyalty, honesty. And here's a painting called Jumping Jive by Norman Lewis, who studied at the party's John Reed Club School of Art. I'll talk more about the John Reed Clubs in a moment, but another feature that separates working class culture from capitalist class culture is working class art. And as an example, the history of black music in America and the role that it has played in resistance is critical to understanding the development of working class music in the US and working class culture. After the 1739 Stono Rebellion, South Carolina officials in the interest of plantation owners passed a law banning enslaved Africans from growing their own food, earning money, learning to read, gathering in groups, as well as their use of drums, horns, and other instruments, which enslaved people could use as forms of communication and organization. These laws quickly spread to the rest of the US due to, fears, due to the fears of enslavers. Perhaps in part as a direct response to these laws, enslaved people developed new forms of music, a new form of communication using whatever resources they had available, including spoons, washboards, stomping their feet, and using their bodies to create rhythm, music, and dance, including call and response singing. These forms, born out of resistance to chattel slavery, carried forward into working class forms of dance and music like jazz, tap, rap, and stepping. Working class art and culture is truly capable of confronting the interests of capital. And again, from Bridging the Divide, Jack Metzger writes that the working class is character-oriented, present-oriented as opposed to future-oriented, anti-status as opposed to having status concerns, solidaristic as opposed to individualistic, stronger loyalties to persons, places, groups, and institutional affiliations as opposed to broader links, unavoidable diversity as opposed to homogeneity, Metzger says that the likely worst result of the working class for the working class is unachieved potential as opposed to the lonely individual for capitalists. But I think loneliness, social isolation, and unachieved potential are cross-class realities under capitalism. There's a 2003 documentary called Born Rich, directed by a young heir of the Johnson & Johnson family, 
and he interviews the children of other big capitalist families, and it's clear that capitalism also destroys their social potential. For the working class, everyone who must make their living from wages and salaries, these cultural features are also second nature, and they're also born out of class struggle. If you must sell your labor power to make a living, then collectivity, loyalty, and sharing are meaningful. However, since the capitalist class is in power, capitalist ideology constantly attacks working class culture and claims that capitalist culture is universally beneficial. You might notice that many features of working class culture are nicer and many features of capitalist class culture are meaner. But since we're using a Marxist analysis, it's important to understand that these cultural traits don't arise out of a metaphysical morality or something inbuilt, but because community and solidarity are of real consequence and meaning to the working class. Similarly, the working class and its cultural features are not static or eternal, existing outside of class struggle. For example, maybe we can imagine in a society that's transcended class struggle that we might all be able to experience life as transformative, a feature which we currently attribute to capitalist class culture. Marx was analyzing class materially, meaning scientifically, and so he didn't decide to champion the working class simply out of sympathy for their condition, but because a scientific analysis reveals the working class to be the revolutionary class under capitalism. The working class, like the capitalist class, like the contradictions between them, and like their particular cultural features, are simply material products of class struggle. And the working class is the class that can move us into a better world. There's a book called The Cultural Front by Michael Denning, which details the vibrant art and popular cultural sphere that emerged in the early to mid 20th century alongside the labor movement, civil rights struggles, the popular front, and the communist party. There were art groups, writing groups, civil rights groups, and groups focused on black liberation and women's liberation, theater, film, music, labor, religious groups, dance, painting groups, all working to expand democratic rights to fight fascism, to further the interests of labor, and to understand and challenge forms of special oppression like racial, national, and gender oppression, which do not spare specially oppressed members of the capitalist class, even though they arise out of class struggle to serve the interest of capitalism. Some of these non-working class forces from specially oppressed members of the capitalist class will join the working class as temporary allies. Some will even align permanently with the working class. The democratic forces of the cultural front together made up a thriving, progressive, well-connected, working class-led mass cultural movement that advanced working class interests and working class consciousness. This was a coalition that understood the importance of participating in mass movements, connecting with mass organizations, and identifying existing centers of influence and power in their communities. The participants in this art and cultural scene even worked their culture into capitalist-owned venues like Hollywood and the music industry, and the communists who worked within the cultural front were not armchair Marxists sitting on the outside. They got involved in progressive and democratic struggles of their time, and they helped to create the conditions that would allow for the continued development of working class consciousness. I wanted to refer to a quote from Louis Althusser's essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses. In this essay, Althusser talks about how capitalism uses two particular types of structures to reinforce its dominance. He calls these two structures ideological state apparatuses, or ISAs, and repressive state apparatuses, or RSAs. Ideological state apparatuses are venues that capitalism uses to propagate its ideology, like schools, sports, literature, and the arts and repressive state apparatuses are venues that capitalism uses to violently reinforce its dominance, like the military, police, prisons, and courts. Althusser writes, quote, the ideological state apparatuses may be not only the stake, but also the site of class struggle, and often of bitter forms of class struggle. The class or class alliance in power cannot lay down the law in the ISAs, the ideological state apparatuses, as easily as it can in the repressive state apparatus, not only because the former ruling classes are able to retain strong positions there for a long time, but also because the resistance of the exploited classes is able to find means and occasions to express itself there 
either by the utilization of their contradictions or by conquering combat positions in them in struggle. So that might sound very theoretical, but what is our party history when it comes to highlighting working class culture through popular cultural venues? CPUSA had its own artist collective called the John Reed Clubs, which formed in 1929. There were John Reed Club chapters across the country. The artists involved, which included names that we would immediately recognize today, like Langston Hughes, produced murals, poems, plays, novels, magazines, music, sculpture, and dance, and members attached themselves to local industries so they could write about them. The writing that the clubs put out was translated into many languages, and Mike Gold, a writer and one of the founders of the John Reed Club, suggested that club members should, quote, spend the next few years in and out of the industry, the local industry that they chose to attach themselves to, studying it from every angle, end quote, and becoming an expert so that they could write, quote, like an insider, not like a bourgeois intellectual observer, end quote. In 1935, the John Reed Clubs were dissolved and CPUSA formed the League of American Writers, which was an evolution of the John Reed Clubs. The League of American Writers welcomed party members and non-members following the party's anti-fascist line. And I wanted to read its aims from the application for membership because I think many of these aims could be useful in thinking about how we can engage as communists today within the art and popular cultural sphere. So um, now I'll read the aims from this document here. To enlist writers in all parts of the United States in a national cultural organization for peace and democracy and against fascism and reaction. To defend the political and social institutions that guarantee a healthy atmosphere for the perpetuation of culture. To insist on the democratic rights of education, freedom of thought and expression, to stimulate the interest of other writers in our program and to offer younger writers in particular our fraternal interest and help. To support progressive trade union organization, especially among professionals and in the liberal arts. To effect an alliance in the interest of culture between American writers and all progressive forces. To support the People's Front in all countries. To cooperate with similar organizations of writers in other countries. The labor movement is advancing really quickly right now, and today's working class might find itself without many venues for amplifying working class culture. As a result, the culture that we might remain most familiar with is the culture of the capitalist class. After all, capitalist class culture reinforces itself at every moment through capitalism's ideological domination of popular cultural venues like Hollywood, music, sports, literature, law, family, school, mass media, politics, religion, and everywhere else. This is a culture that only truly fits the capitalist class and which works even better for capitalism when the working class accepts it as their own. And so some questions that I wanna pose and what I hope we can continue to hammer out is how can we challenge this? What is it to be working class today? What are the shared experiences, victories, and stories of the working class? What are today's modern mass cultural mediums and venues? Are there organizations in our communities we can start working with who are making important progressive changes that advance the interests of workers and oppressed people, even if the organizations or individuals who make them up might not consider themselves pol particularly political? What is the plus that we bring as communists to working class culture? Is literature where most people are experiencing culture today? What about social media? How do we build a cultural front fit for our time? I think our aspiration should be to participate in the realizing of a vibrant, exciting, optimistic, forward-facing, welcoming, diverse working class culture. This is a culture which already fits everyone who must make their living from wages and salaries. So, when we get to the question and answer session at the end of today's classes, I wanna hear your thoughts. How can we promote the interests of working class culture within the popular culture of our time and as an extension of our party strategy in current stage of struggle for an all people's front to defeat the extreme right? Thank you, Eric. 
Before we open the floor for discussion, we have one more short item. Okay, continuing. The Marxist framework argues that social being determines consciousness. What is meant by social being is the actual material context, the objective conditions of existence of the actual setting in which we develop as human beings. As a result of working class people having the same fundamental conditions of existence, the same objective social being of no possession of wealth producing property, no ownership, no ownership of private property, and as a result, having to sell our ability to labor to live, for us objectively cultivated is a necessary orientation toward collectivity instead of individualism, cooperation instead of competition, interdependence instead of independence, and a focus on care for community well-being instead of just a focus on the well-being of the lone individual. These two are traits and characteristics about which we can be proud as working class people. These are traits and characteristics that make up our identity and culture as working class people. What will also help us is the conscious cultivation of our historical narrative as the US working class. Our historical narrative as the working class is different from the historical narrative of the nation. For example, where does our historical narrative as the working class in this country begin? Or at least what is an aspect of the US working class historical narrative? Do we make a mistake if we simply begin with permanent enslavement? Do we make a mistake if we simply begin with a period of slavery? Within the English colonies, there was a widespread system of bonded, meaning unfree labor. They were unfree because they were indentured servants, which can be best understood as temporary enslavement. Was this the condition of most who toiled during the very early colonies? Some have argued the condition of permanent enslavement was dictated by the Virginia courts as a branding of African indentured servants to create a material basis of division between the cooperating community of indentured, of indentured servants, which included black, white, and indigenous people. This was one of the first racist court decisions for the purpose of weakening unified struggle among those forced into temporary enslavement. We have to ask our young historians to reconstruct this narrative for us as they retell the historical origin story of our working class. The work of our working class think tank has only begun to scratch the surface. Collectivity instead of rank individualism, cooperation instead of petty counterproductive competition, interdependence instead of loan independence, and care for community as class instead of care for just the loan self are cultural pillars undergirding our various ethnic flavorings. Cultural pillars undergirding our various ethnic flavorings, collectivity, cooperation, interdependence, and community make real equality and real democracy a requirement.
to stand up for us and the reality of who we are and how we differ as a class from other classes requires not a neglect of race, nationality, and gender, but a deepening of our grasp of how these factors objectively and subjectively play a role. The racially and nationally oppressed must fight for real democracy. Women must fight for real democracy. The LGBTQ plus must fight for real democracy if we are to be free of social domination and oppression. The working class must fight for real equality and real democracy if it is to be free of exploitation, social domination, and oppression. Capitalism hides its inherent ills, its inherent inability to satisfy the well being needs of the working class behind the ideological claim of inbred human inferiority. Growing our identity as working class USA Growing our knowledge of our glorious history of working class struggle and deepening our understanding of our inherent class interest in real equality and real democracy are all acts of resistance, forms of dis defiant resistance, which strengthen, consolidate, and solidify our working class cause to end the fundamental origin of human misery today, the outmoded system of capitalism. People, planet, and peace before profit. A better world is necessary. Thank you, and we'll now open the floor for discussion. Molly? Thank you to the presenters. My name is Molly. I'm going to be moderating the discussion today. We are really grateful and uh, thank you for your presence and invite you uh, to uh, share with us your thoughts. We'll take as many questions as we can um, before turning it back over to the panelists. And uh, for now, I am looking for raised hands. Jack Meta, your mic is open. Hello, thanks. I, um, in response to Eric's question on where and how to create working class cultural ideology, I want to make a very brief case for horror. You have films like Bong Joon-ho's Parasite, Boot Riley's Sorry to Bother You, Jordan Peele's Get Out, and Us that all deeply interact with class and also race in some of those and thinking about how movies like that can get made. I think horror specifically as a genre, which is fairly broad and very popular, and is also, you're seeing folks from diverse backgrounds creating horror that gets released to a large public. It's also a place where small films can get produced and then picked up by larger distribution houses like Blumhouse. I think this is an attractive venue for making working class art because it already, is a genre that focuses on what's going on, what are you anxious about in your current environment. So it seems like a place that um, that leftist media can be strategically deployed in in a fairly straightforward way. Thank you, Jack. If the person who put the question in the chat uh, about Du Bois would mind uh, sharing using the mic, we would appreciate that. I'm gonna read this as I can. Uh, I think it's also worth mentioning the literary works of contemporary Marxist re reading for listeners, for those interested in either. They also both have regularly updated podcasts. I feel they are worth mentioning for more reading along with Du Bois, Winston. I think we missed some of this. It, it would be really helpful if folks could uh, introduce your question 
using your mic. We're not really able to use the chat. Okay, Molly, I see uh, something that Kathy wrote. As an older senior, my hopes are to involve others my age. This presentation has been informative and encouraging. Any more hands, Molly? I don't see any hands. Um, I, I will say I, I think that, um, yeah, I'm really, really intrigued by this conversation. And um, I know that where I'm from, there is a really strong cultural scene. Um, arts districts uh and i think that that b bringing back a like a maybe a type of festival or club or some type of collective of um you know the cultural front uh might be a, a really incredible um project um for our party to to try to to initiate um so I, I don't know if there's any more kind of precedence about that that folks have um, have learned about. I, I, I know that one of the presenters talked about the John Reed clubs. Um, Langston Hughes is, is from Cleveland. Um, yeah, so if there's any more comments about like what the party could do uh, to develop um, to develop the consciousness of, of working class culture, um, that would be awesome to hear. Okay, Molly, let's turn it over to uh, to the panelists. Um, maybe we'll start with uh, uh, Anita, then go to Eric, and then um, and then uh, we'll close out. Anita? Yes, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you to all uh, the presenters today. That was uh, really informative um, and inspiring. Um, I really... Uh, wanted to respond uh, i think we got off and i'm glad we did uh, uh talking about it, it somehow the culture of the uh, working class is easier to talk about if we're talking about cultural products like music and literature um and i i really was fascinated by the history of the john reed um club because we're trying to get the mike gold collective um uh, uh, even more influential. Uh, it started here in Columbus, and um, and they're doing some uh, really good work on um, covering, for instance, the UAW picket line. Um, on cultural programming, we had a, a wonderful cultural program provided to uh, the people who had gone to the uh, New York for the climate march, um, and that was excellent. And it included. Um, a reggae performer who was from the uh, Amazon Labor Union. Um, it was just a, a, a more variety of uh, uh, programming. And I have a special place in my heart for reggae music because I studied that in, in some detail when I was in graduate school. And I think uh, when Eric was talking about how we can um, democratize uh, or, uh, or, or let working class people have their say culturally. I think um, social media is a way of doing that. Um, back in the 1960s, anybody could make a reggae uh, record, a single. You would just go down and, and have it pressed and take a, a, a paper bag full of 45s to the corner and, and hawk them off at you know some um, cheap point of sale. Um, and I think now we have TikTok and things like that, where any anybody can um, can can make some kind of cultural content. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else has been see watching the Sean Fain um, TikToks. They're just amazing uh, and really inspirational. Um, so uh, so yeah, I think. Uh, you know, something like a movie, like uh, Sorry to Bother You, or any of those other things. They take some some investment and and I think uh, in terms of, of poor people's culture uh, we need something even more uh, uh, you know democratized so um, I think this has been a really great discussion I'm happy to have participated so uh, that's all I've got thanks all Eric yeah thank you Dee and thank you also to all of the presenters it's really exciting to um, be learning theory and experiencing theory now with our party uh, in the present moment. And I just think it's a really cool opportunity to have. Um, and to respond also to Jack's comment, 
I, I don't know. I don't know that I have like a, a, a wonderful, fully thought out response here, except to say that, well, the, the SAG after strikes, WJA strikes that are happening right now, hopefully will inspire some more working class consciousness within the people who are actually making the film, TV content that we watch. Um, and so from what I read about the John Reed clubs, the people who worked within these clubs grew their consciousness, learned together through the process of these clubs, and then naturally also made their way into the entrenched industry. Um, I, I think it is an open question how, how to create content from a Marxist perspective that people actually like, it's one thing to be on social media or something and on an account where everybody who follows you is completely like-minded or basically like-minded, but to be able to somehow find ways of sharing with a lot of people in, in a mass way um, is maybe not an easy question to answer, but I hope we can continue to think about it. And like you said, the directors like Boots Riley, Jordan Peele, um, and I think you mentioned a third director, and I didn't hear whose name you said, are, are already putting out like things that lots and lots and lots of people are seeing. Um, so those are my kind of incomplete thoughts, but it's an open question to me. Okay, thank you, uh, Eric. Um, uh, on behalf of the working class think tank, I'd like to thank everyone who made a contribution to the uh, to this project? Uh, it's a pro it's a work in in uh, progress. Uh, we just scratched the surface. We hope you will, when the call is issued, we hope you will step forward and participate in uh, various uh, aspects of trying to realize and promote and project uh, who we are as a as working class USA and and uh, in all of our democratic traditions uh, and, in, and in all of our democratic traditions associated with our various ethnic, national, racial uh, flavorings. Um, so um, again, thank you. This is a work in progress. We just scratched the surface. We hope you will uh, join uh, in the effort to bring into being uh, more and more uh, a, uh, the con a, a consciousness, a class and socialist consciousness within uh, Working Class USA. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Anita. Thank you to all of the presenters this morning. Thank you to uh, Michelle for uh, sending us the uh, recording, uh, which we will share uh, on, uh, on the question of women. Uh, thank you to all of the uh, teachers, uh, presenters uh, prior. Uh, we appreciate uh, your contribution and um, we hope you will uh, help us uh, to build and to grow, to reach our uh, desired result of a better world befitting human beings. Thank you. Hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Hope you can get some rest. Thank you, everyone, again. Good Thank day. Thank you.